Hi, this is Toby Salgado. I'm here to help you answer a question that we all have. How can I build my business faster and better? Each week, I interview top producing real estate agents, coaches, and authors. I find out, I dig in, I find out how they did it, where they struggled, and how they overcame the obstacles that in, inevitably gets in front of all of us. And I did that so both you and I, so we all can reach our own full potential. If you want more of the tips and strategies we cover in this session, you're gonna to wanna to do two things. First, go to our site, superagentslive.com and subscribe to the show on iTunes so that you don't miss any of the conversations we have in the future. And second, download my free ebook and learn how to stack the deck in your favor. Before we get going, let's hear from our sponsor. Our new sponsor, Discover Publications, takes that one step further. For just slightly more than the cost of a stamp, Discover Publications creates a completely customized newspaper. Now, they'll go out and they'll curate content, or you can create your own. All of my sponsors are white labeled. Now, I called, prior to having them on the show, I called some of Discover Publications clients, and I talked to this one guy, and he does some interesting things. He'll go out and interview restaurants that are in his farm, in his sphere. He creates a write-up. He, interestingly enough, resells advertising in his own newspaper to his trusted network, whether that's the plumber or the insurance agent. And by the way, this guy has 60% market penetration. He told me the paper has cemented those numbers. If you're interested, go check out discoverpubs.com. Let me know what you think. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Hey, one other quick thing before we get to it. I just cut a deal with Bob Corcoran's organization. Any of you that want to get a free coaching call, you can. You know, Bob loves what we're doing for aspiring super agents, and he wanted to lend a hand. If you want to get your free coaching call, send an email to Bubba, just like it sounds, B-U-B-B-A, Bubba, at CorcoranCoaching.com, and let him know you listen to the show. Let's get to it. Hey, Lance, uh, thanks for taking the time out today. Oh, my pleasure. So I've given the audience a brief overview of your background, but maybe take a minute. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Well, I have uh, been in the business for 25 years, roughly. Uh, I got into the business through a construction background. My degree is in accounting from USC, actually the East Coast USC, South Carolina, uh, the University of South Carolina. Uh, but... Um, uh, I, I got in the business the way a lot of people do, just, you know, got in, started selling some homes, getting some listings. But I tell you, I got lucky in early on in my career, and through a transaction, I met a top performing agent in another area. And that gentleman became my mentor early on in my career and kind of showed me what, uh, you know, um, showed me a different way to do real estate. And what, what does that mean? How, what, a different way. What is that different way? Well, when I got into the business, and of course now, you know, people get into business now, of course it may not sound so different, but when I got into business, uh, the the larger companies and all uh, even frowned on a agent having an assistant. You know, uh, yeah. the agent was supposed to do everything, do the paperwork, you know, uh, call, you know, make calls, uh, uh, do whatever, and, and actually – the whole model was set up on, on basically having a small business. You know, some agents did all right, but it was basically being a small practitioner, handling a, a handful of clients and doing every single thing yourself. Uh, this gentleman showed me um, how having a team could be more effective, and it was the first glimpse I had at forming a team. And so I started, I'm, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, so it's not like it happened for me uh, instantly. But I started developing this ideal and started, you know, listening to him and 
Um, I was the first agent in this area to have a website, for instance, as, and it's because he called me up one day and he said, you've got to be on the Internet. And um, the, um, But over the years, what I've developed is, um, and I decided to leave the bigger companies and start my own company, which I'm, is, has worked very well for me. I'm glad I did it. Um, actually, several of the bigger companies around here have tried several times to buy me out and get me back into their companies. But I've developed a team, and uh, we we sell homes. And because of my background, uh, we um, we can really think outside of the box. Um, you know, we, we renovate houses and flip them, and uh, that's something I kind of do on the side with my business. But the way it helps me is because it allows me to be able to give our sellers very useful information and even uh, assist them into in accomplishing, you know, getting their houses ready for sale. You know, as you know, uh, a house that is that really looks ready to sell, a house that is that looks great, is much easier to sell and will get more money. It will sell quicker and get more money. And as simple as that sounds, um, you know, I find that most agents never even talk to owners about that. They'll go in, somebody will call them up and say, I want to list my house. And they'll say, okay, what price do you want on it? And they stick a sign out there and just, you know, hope something happens. We have a full plan where we go in, we have a, an aggressive marketing plan. Uh, we go in and take a look at the physical property. And, and incidentally, we do that after they've committed to us too. We don't go in and t- start telling them everything they should do and giving them all the information before they've even committed to us. Uh, but then we go in and tell them what should be adjusted about the house. And sometimes it's simply deep decluttering and depersonalizing. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit more, some painting, some countertops, some carpets or hardwood floors or whatever. And, uh, and then we put them on the market and sell. And we have a, a pricing strategy that works very well also. But... As far as the business is concerned, what I have found is, you know, you need effective marketing. Uh, people that are afraid to spend money on marketing uh, will, uh, it's hard to get, it's hard to build up a volume of business. Um, um, the other thing is that having systems in place. Um, one book that I read recently uh, talked about how, you know, the, the best run businesses are, you know, have systems that run the business and people that runs the systems hmm. rather than people running the businesses. <laughs> yeah. If that makes any no, sense. No, that t- makes total sense. I love it. So that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's how we do uh, anything uh, specific you'd like me to talk more about? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, uh, uh, absolutely, yes, we're going to dig into that. So let's go back to the team, right? And so here's the, here's the thing that I see, right? It, you know, and even Lance, this show, this show really is a, is a show about entrepreneurship, but through the lens of a real estate agent. And I, and I think the, the, a problem I see with agents out there, right? They, they go and they get licensed and they hang their shingle out and, uh, you know, they don't think of this as a business. They don't, you know, and, and you built, you, you, whatever your background, whatever thing, oh, I'm sorry, it was your mentor, right? He taught you to build a business. That's, you know, replicate yourself. Go hire an assistant, you know, h- hire a team. Why is it, Lance, that, that people don't think of being a real estate or selling real estate as a business and treat it like that? Uh, you know, I tell you, I, it's beyond me because uh, when when my eyes were open and I looked at this as a business and that I could develop a business, uh, for one thing, it became more fun to me. Um, you know, you're not just running around like a little rat, uh, you know, taking care of so many things you can't even think straight. And, if, and of course, you're taking care of so many things you can only handle right. a couple of clients at a time. Um you know, once I put a team in place, and it didn't just happen overnight. You, you've got to work on it. You know, if you're, you know, if you're if you're a genius, maybe, or if you have a solid business background in something else, uh, maybe it can happen a little bit faster. But I had to do a lot of reading. I had to go to seminars. I connected with other people. I, I was lucky. I've been lucky through my career that I've been able to connect with top agents around the country that I've. I've learned from, and I've uh, they've shared with me, and I've 
taken their secrets and applied it to my business. Uh, but when you break it down at like a business, then you have uh, team members that focus on specific jobs. Everybody can be more effective and, uh, you know, just create more business. And um, it's, you know, it's like, uh, I think one reason that a team like that works well is because no matter how good you are, uh, it is hard to be good at every single thing. Right. You know, it's hard to yeah. be a detail person and then also be the people person you need to be when you're right in front of the clients and also be the coach you need to be uh, when you're, you know, having to help the clients understand what really needs to be done to be successful in this transaction. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, you know, so what you do is you set up your system and then you hire people that are good at those individual jobs. And as you get people that really, um, uh, you know, that, that really work on the team and you form a team that is cohesive and, uh, and works together, uh, that is one thing that I have found that I don't care how talented they are, you don't allow people to get into your team that do not fit with the team because it will become a poison. Uh, yes. They, you know, it will become a negative to the team. So you've got to be careful about that, of course. Because I, sometimes I, I hear, um, you know, around my area, um, I've achieved enough success that people are starting to copy me, and I can see, I can see that. I mean, some of it's pretty obvious. I, uh, I called an agent um, uh, a month ago or so. And on her recording on her phone was my exact message. Um, the, uh, and of course, I that I was flattered. I, you know, uh, obviously she, you know, she felt like I was somebody to try to emulate. Uh, but um, um, uh, you know, I if you if if you if you do it correctly and you and you form a team, it becomes more fun. Uh, everybody's enjoying themselves more and everybody's making more money. Bottom line. I, I 100% agree. And, and I'll, let, let me, I'll say this too. So, you know, right now in terms of, uh, you know, people, it, we're startup crazy right now, right? So everybody's out there, you know, they went and they saw the social network movie. They saw what Mark Zuckerberg did with Facebook and everybody is out trying to create businesses. And I say that, I'm going to tie this team thing in here in a second. So venture capital. So you can go out and you can create an app. You can create a product, right? Some kind of technical thing. And you can, you know, you go to venture capital and say, hey, I need a million bucks or any 300 grand or whatever it is. They will not fund you if you are a solo guy. It just won't happen. Um, um, there, there's, there's a bunch of incubators, tech stars. There's a... Oh, God, the big one I can't think of right now. But they want you to have at least one other team member. And, and here's one of the main reasons why is because what you mentioned, Lance, you said, hey, it's, it's hard to wear all those hats. That's one thing. But the second thing is business is hard, man. Life gets in the way. And when you know and, and sometimes you, you know, sometimes you don't want to get up and do it right but if you have somebody there to support you to to prop you up that that will make a you know this is sort of a um uh it's not a role and responsibility but there's there's some magic there right even for you i'm sure there's some days where you're like i don't want to go into the office but people rely on you lance so you have this team and you know what you get more done simply because there's people there that rely on you you know and look you got to write the, their check at the end of the day Oh uh, yeah, they they definitely depend on me to write that check. But um, but I tell you one thing about it is is um, when it's when it's really humming well, um, it's it, it becomes so much fun. So I tell you, there is very few days that I just don't really want to come in. Now, that doesn't happen a whole lot. Uh, I'm like everybody else. I like my recreation, uh, but I enjoy my business so much. Um, it doesn't even feel like work a lot of times. I, I enjoy what I do. It, it, it takes effort. Uh, it takes concentration. Uh, but, you know, we all need to do need something to do anyway. Uh, so I, I, I enjoy it. What I am working on now is uh, because I think that the, the, you know, you've kind of reached, um, I don't know, I don't know exactly how to put it. It's, uh, you know, you've reached the, I'm, I'm not, uh, Pinnacle is not the right word, but when you when your business is at the point where it can run completely without you, 
you know, then then you're then you've arrived. Yes. Um, my business is uh, is getting close to that point. A couple of years ago, I went to uh, France for um, a few weeks with uh, my daughter, and uh, we traveled all around and all. And um, uh, you know, even in just a, a few years' time, things have changed so much. So now it's easier to have the phones and all. But at the time, I was going to have to pay kind of a hefty charge just to have the phone in Europe. And I just didn't want to do it. Um, so I told my staff, I said, you know, I'm going to be on, you know, I'll be looking at my emails probably every couple of days. So, you know, handle it. Don't, don't count on me because you're probably not going to be able to get me. Uh, I came back. Uh, we had uh, 12 new contracts, uh, 15 new listings, uh, buyers signed up. All that happened while I was gone. And that made me feel very well. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a great treat to come. And look, here's here's I, I talk about this uh, all the time, sort of in my personal life to my friends. What you described, right? There's a difference between a business and a company. A business needs you. A business relies on you. <clears throat> a company you're just a, it does, a company doesn't rely on you, right? There's, there's systems, right? And we're going to talk about systems, but there's systems, there's roles and responsibilities and that company. Look, that's where I agree with you. That's where you want to get to. You want to build a company, not a business. And, you know, and I know, you know, what you said is what you said earlier is, you know, uh, some of the bigger players have come to buy you out. You know why? It's because you've built that company. If you had a business, you know, I, 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 and especially even if we go back to that one, the, the agent who tries to be the, the lone wolf, right? You're never going to get acquisition offers because it's you, right? You need to create a company. So anyhow, sorry. This is more about oh, absolutely. you. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. You can't create value if it's just you doing the business. There's no value there. It's just you. You know, if you walk away, there's nothing else. That's right. It's gone. Uh, when you create a company that is is performing this service, uh, then you have value. And um, um, I, I like to see it grow. I, the, the accounting part of me, that that part of my background, uh, enjoys seeing it come together on the financial. Right. Everybody. That's well. That's the fun part, right? Seeing the seeing the books get bigger and bigger. Okay, so 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 if people are listening to this, Lance, and they're like, you know what? Yeah, Lance makes a lot of sense. I want to, I want to build what he's got. Where, you know, um, where do they start? Because I can tell you that, man, high, going through the hiring process, knowing how to roll, you know, knowing how to do an interview, right, and and uncovering, uh, you know, what the important things are, it's tough. And what you one critical thing you said earlier, you said that if you get the wrong person for your culture, you know, even if they're super talented, that becomes poisonous. Yes. How? What, yes, you so, do not want the. Uh... Teams do not uh, work well with prima donna. Right. Um, so, w- w- can you give us some some it, some tips? Like, where where does somebody start with you know hiring a what first person should they hire and uh, and maybe sort of mechanically explain what how they should go about that? Uh, you know, I think what you should do is uh, evaluate yourself and decide where your strengths and weaknesses are. And then, of course, your first hires should be covering your weaknesses Mm. and, you know, free you up so that you can focus on your strengths. Uh, Now, most of us, uh, my first hire was an assistant to help me with all the paperwork and all. And that makes sense for most people. Now, if for some reason you're different, if, you know, if your forte is really doing paperwork, then I guess you need to hire a salesman. But uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it done that way. My matter of fact, in all the teams and all I know across the United States, I, I haven't seen one develop that way yet. Yeah, me but, neither. Uh, but you, have, you, know, you, you, you evaluate your, your weaknesses and, uh, and then hire to cover those weaknesses. Um, you know, I uh, heard something recently I was listening to, and it really made me think about how even salespeople, uh, not all salespeople are good at converting on the phone. And it was talking about one salesperson that actually hired somebody to convert the lead, and then they met with them. And um, uh, it's uh, and it and it increased the business. I can't remember. It was increased the business a lot for them just by making that simple little change. But that was somebody that could really look at themselves 
um, honestly and evaluate their weaknesses. I think the holdup or the, the stumbling block we we have is that most of us that get into business, you know, have uh, at least a certain amount of ego. Um, and your ego um, doesn't want you to admit to any weaknesses usually. You know, you know, I'm good at everything. I can do everything. There's no, you know, and uh, so uh, what you have to do is understand that you have an ego, try to push it away from you far enough that you can look at things honestly and then you know, start the hiring process. And then what you need to do is break your business down. You know, what jobs need to be done and then set up systems to get those jobs done. Let me break in here with a message from our sponsor. Our sponsor, Discover Publications, will create a customized, branded, 12-page newspaper that will be sent out to your farm and sphere. Now, this paper is cheaper than you think. For slightly more than the cost of a stamp, you can start sending out curated content and always stay top of mind. Never lose a deal again because that prospect just happened to forget that you were in real estate or misplaced your number. Go check them out at discoverpubs.com. Got it. Yeah, I love it. Look, I 100% I agree with everything you said, right? So outsource your weaknesses and play to your strengths. <clears throat> you know, that that person, the, the, the story that you heard where, you know, they couldn't really convert on the phone, but they were good in person. <clears throat> um, I, I, I wonder how many people are doing that because, you know, that's that's how software companies do it. So software companies, <clears throat> you know, they, they have this, you know, nice person on the front end that's, you know, very knowledgeable, but just nice. And they get the appointment and then you have a killer come in, you know, and close the deal. Um, and I and look, even for me, Lance, I'm not necessarily the super nice guy to, to build rapport with, I, I, but I can close. And, if, you know, if I used to have a team member like that, everybody loved this guy. He would chat him up, talk about golf, and then boom, I would close him. 100% of the time we would close. Anyhow, so so. <clears throat> Is that a model that you, that you have seen more and more, right? You, the, 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 um, uh, the phone person and then the closer. Uh, that, yeah, that is the model that I'm seeing more and more. Uh, they're called ISAs, as you know, uh, inside sales agents. And uh, their responsibility is to convert the lead to an appointment and then the agent convert the appointment to a client. And, uh, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, you can – you can keep breaking down your business uh, to more and more degrees. Of course, you don't want to get ridiculous and, 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 and break it down to the point where it's becoming laborious again. Right. But, uh, you know, but it, it, it's really fun to me how, you know, when I first started this, I wouldn't even have thought about that separation. You know, like uh, I would have just always assumed that the salesperson that was meeting with them would be the salesperson talking to them on the phone. Uh, but now I see that it doesn't have to be that way, and maybe it shouldn't even be that way. Um, uh, there's a better way. Staying open to look at different industries, to look at different people and teams in your industry, and uh, being willing to take an honest look and evaluate you and take in the data and then apply the things that really work and will work well for you to your businesses. And that's what I've tried to do over the years. It's just, you know, like I said, you know, uh, forget about the ego and uh, try to get rid of it or push it to the side and really just take an honest look at what's happening, who is being successful, what works. And if I, if I apply something, I did something recently with a, uh, you know, I hired another telemarketer, and I, uh, up front, I mean, I was I was telling everybody, oh, this is going to be super great, and within two weeks' time, I could tell that I had made a big mistake. Well, my ego would have made me try to correct that somehow or hide it or keep saying, no, it's okay, but uh, luckily, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't do that. I realized that, no, this was a mistake, and I changed it. You know, I made a, made a change to it. And, you know, business is, is, as you know, that's, that's a lot with you know, anything in life, but definitely in business is being able to honestly look at the data and make adjustments where it makes sense. Yes. Um, Even if it's your fault. Right. <laughs> Especially if it's your fault. I agree. Yes. So, so um, uh, 
in terms of finding your strengths, um, have you ever read uh, a Strengths Finder 2.0? Uh, no, I haven't. Mm, okay. I'm gonna write that one down. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it maybe some you know maybe it's good for your you know, somebody on your team or whatever. But yeah, it's it's a way to help you. It's a it's a really the, this process to help you figure out what you're good at. You know, and then and then outsource the rest of it. All right. So, uh, um, there's so much stuff I want to talk to you about. Um, really quickly. So so let's say you know so you hire your assistant. You know maybe maybe you have one more person on your team, um, and now you, you need to create uh, you need to create systems. What like what are some of your systems look like that that work well for you? Well, we um, uh, we've got it broken down. So and and uh, and I tell you, if uh, anyone that wants to do it, if they can find a coach or a mentor that can show them the way, of course, it makes it so much easier. Yeah. But uh, you know what I did was I started breaking it down uh, with the help of my first mentor. Um, and uh, decided on the job that needed to be done, and see, and so like up front in the administration, we have it broken down into a listing coordinator and a closing coordinator. Um, and when we list properties, it goes into you know every listing goes into our contact management program with a checklist of of things to be done. And and it's all done, and it's it's simple. I mean, it's every little detail from putting a lockbox on, ordering the sign, ordering the photograph, uh, following up on the showings, uh, you know, giving feedback, encouraging the price improvements, you know, right down the line. So we have a successful, you know, we a, a successful listing. We get them from first day on the market to under contract. And we do that pretty good. You know, the system is working well. Uh, then as soon as it goes on the contract, uh, they're moved to the closing file. Same thing happens. It's attached with a to-do list from following up with the mortgage company to setting up with the attorneys. Oh, we're an attorney state, so closings are done with attorneys. Huh. Setting it up, up, the closings with the attorneys, you know, all the little details that have to be done. And then what happens afterwards they're transferred from closing into past client. And then it's all to me, I, I look at it almost like a circle where they start out as a prospect. They, they're they then a listing. We've converted them to a listing. They're now in the contract. And now they're back up at the top where they're part of our lead generation again because our past clients get our newsletter among those things and our encouragement to send us referrals. And we get a lot of referrals from that. You know, um, uh, that's uh, another thing that I think that agents a lot of times, um, they don't understand that that can be put into a system. They think of referral as just, okay, if somebody likes me, they'll refer me. And it's almost just, uh, you know, it happens when it happens kind of thing. But you can systematize that as well. You know, you can encourage that. You can explain that uh, to your past clients and your sphere of influence. Um, then of course you have to have a system to handle lead capture, uh, lead distribution and lead management. Um, so the, if you're using the ISA, which is a good way to do it, uh, all the leads have to be funneled through one system and then dispersed, but they also have to be, uh, tracked. You know, um, what I have found is when agents know that you're, you know, tracking all these uh, leads, all the leads that they're getting, they seem to do a better job at trying to convert them for some reason, you know, because they know you're looking over their shoulders. Right. Uh, and then, of course, you have the agents in place that are converting, you know, uh, going on the appointment and converting the buyers and sellers. My company is our biggest focus is on getting that seller client. That's our biggest marketing effort. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, uh, other people can do it different ways, but we found for us, uh, the more listings we have, the more we have of everything, buyers and everything else. Um, and, um, you know, so those are the, those are the systems that we put in place to make sure it all works. And then when the, when the agent signs up the listing, then it goes to administration and it's put into contact management and it's just followed. 
And that's the only way to do a volume of business because if you were trying to handle 100 listings and you uh, were just doing it the old-fashioned way, I mean, you'd go crazy. Oh, you know, there man. would be no way to do it. You'd yeah. be dropping balls every single day every time you turned around. Doing and, it this way, you can actually handle 100 listings or more and and drop very few balls. I love it. So, so you, 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 you have systemized everything, right? So the listing, the closing, lead capture, lead distribution, all the way to follow up and asking for referrals. Let me ask you something. So, uh, so you have this, this, um, so the first one is the, the, the system for the listing and you have, you know, that goes in a file and you, you have it very granular, all detailed out. Now, is that a piece of paper or is that something on is that a piece of paper with a like a checklist oh uh, well uh, no it's on it's on our it's, it's the computer system we have it's um, um and the system that we use is internet based and i like that because i could you know i can be anywhere i can go on my phone and go to the system and look at the listings we have and pull up individual clients or anything but you know really uh all that is a choice of the individual, which way they really prefer it. Uh, I, I have, I talked to somebody recently that said they really prefer the old fashioned way of having everything on their hard drive. I don't know why you'd really want that, but, uh, but that's them. Um, uh, the, uh, and, and if it's simply just having a checklist in a file, uh, it all accomplishes the same thing as, as, as long as you, you know, work it correctly. You know, I found early on when I first started doing this, I had, I put these systems in place and my first administrative people just were not using them. Even after I tried to explain it and everything, I don't know, it was a mental block. They couldn't, they couldn't seem to follow it, even though it seemed very simple. And um, I'm not really sure why, but, but, you know, that's another part of business. Whenever you find that you've hired somebody to do a job, and they just can't seem to do it, whether they're a nice person or not, you need to free up their future and get somebody else in that position that will do the job and can do it. Free and, up um, their future. <laughs> yes. That's funny. Free up their future. <laughs> so, uh, so real quick, so so you, you were on the cloud with this stuff. Is is that a system that anybody can buy, or did you guys develop this? this I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with this <clears throat> this listing process and the closing process that you go through. Uh, no, uh, actually, the program that we use is one that uh, a lot of agents use. Uh, it's not just it's not one that I've developed. And then, then that's another thing. I'm you know I'm not a computer programmer or anything. And you can you know there's a lot of tools out there that are available very inexpensively. Um, so you don't have to go out there and spend big bucks on trying to you know develop programs yourself or anything. Now, if you develop a, a a better program that you could sell to other agents and all that could make you money as well. But, but I've got to focus on my business. I, you know, if I did that, it would take me away from sure. the business that I'm in. Can so. you, can you tell me what it's called? If somebody wants to. Oh yeah. Yeah. If I don't mind at all. I didn't know if you wanted the name brand or not. The, the, the product, the product I use is called top producer. Got it. Yeah. Yep. Very familiar with those guys. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't know it did all that. I, you know, I kind of look into that. Um, they actually reached out to me. They wanted me to to work with them, and I just I haven't even opened up their software. <clears throat> Anyhow, okay. So let's uh, let's go. Um, I want to go back. One of the value adds, right? One of your unique selling uh, propositions, I think, is you have this. You have this aggressive marketing plan when you do get a listing. Can you can you unpack that a little bit? What what does that look like? Uh, well, we, we, you know, uh, um, over the years, we've developed a reputation of being a, a really a, a home selling team or company. Um, and we have an aggressive home selling system. And, you know, it's, uh, and it starts with getting the people to give us a chance to list their home. And that comes from all of our marketing and all. And we, uh, we, uh, market, uh, we, uh, uh, not exclusively, but we we have a guaranteed sale program that we market a lot, and that gets a lot of draws. And um, um, and then of course we uh, meet the individuals. But what I found is that, or at least what works for us, is once you get the client to sign up, uh, you can't just you know hope that the house will sell. 
it's like any other product. Um, early on, when I first got into business, I went to a seminar, and the uh, uh, the guy that was leading the seminar, I, I, I've been to a couple of classes, and I was trying to uh, figure out, you know, what was, uh, you know, what would work the best. How could I sell houses? You know, how do you set this up so that houses actually sell? And I remember the guy. I asked him. I said, "How do you do this so that that so that you can pretty much guarantee that this house will sell?" And he said, "There's no way to do that. Um, you just put them on the market, and some sell, and some don't." And that just did not make any sense to me at all because I, I, I immediately thought of uh, at the time one of the bigger builders in the area was Stentex. It's a company you've probably heard of them. There, I think they're out of Texas, and they're across the United States in a lot of communities. And they build and sell 10,000 homes a year or something, I think I read. Um, and I thought to myself, I said, I know that Syntex does not just build a lot of houses and think, well, some of them are going to sell and some of them aren't. Uh, I said, I just know it doesn't happen that way. So there, there has to be another way. And since he had already given me his answer, I didn't even query him any further to, to try to find out anything further. Um, but um, um, uh, but I started thinking about it and reading and and then like I said I met my first mentor and um, and I and I started coming up with a plan that could help people sell houses and it was and it was based on a formula uh, that I came up with and it's marketing merchandising and pricing equals sold and what it what I came to discover is that if you have a solid marketing plan that effectively gets the message out about this property, if you merchandising is about how it's displayed, just like if you're and a lot of times when I talk to clients, I relate selling their house to selling a box of cereal. And I, I know that sounds kind of funny when you first hear it, but what I tell them is that, you know, when you go into the grocery store to buy a box of cereal, you know, first of all, you break it down into sections. I tell them, I say, you know, at one time I was a Cocoa Puff man. I was about 10 years old. <laughs> now I'm a granola man, yeah. you know, and then I go to the granola section, just like you're looking at houses. I'm looking at, you know, single family. I'm looking at condos. I'm looking at lake properties. I'm looking at acreage. Uh, you break it down into sections, and then you start evaluating the individual properties, and the buyer is drawn to the property that, you know, that represents the best value to them, price, the way it looks. When I look at that box of cereal, you know, I like the fruits and the nuts. And also, if I see the picture with all that kind of stuff, it tends to draw my attention. I'm drawn into it. And then I evaluate price. And that's the same thing with the houses. We have, we have a strong marketing system. We look at the house. And I tell people right up front, I tell them, when I look at your house, I'm going to tell you what I really think. I'm not going to pull punches with you or anything. I'm going to tell you what I really think needs to be done to make this a sellable house. And uh, and then we have a, a pricing strategy that, that works, and it's based on pricing it correctly. But when you price it correctly, the seller will end up getting the most money. Got it. And going back to merchandising and that granola analogy is, you know, people pay extra to be on at eye level in the, well, the vendors pay extra to be at eye level in the grocery store. If you are, you might have that same granola with the, with the nuts and the berries and all that stuff, but it's on the bottom shelf. Um, you know, that is going to sell less than the one on the, uh, at eye level. So similarly for you, right? So you have this product, which is the house, you know, uh, you need to do a good job of getting it out to people, right? Getting it out at eye level to them. Uh, exactly, and that's where the strong marketing comes into play. You know, you don't just uh, stick it in the multiple listing. I mean, that's multiple listing is a great way to sell houses, and we use the multiple listing system, but we do so much more. And because of it, we sell we sell a good third, if even even not a little bit more than a third of our own inventory. Wow. Wow, that's amazing! Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's uh, it's very high for the industry. So you, one thing, one other thing you do. So this, so I, 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 briefly, you know, the guaranteed sale thing. Um, how many houses? Look here, I want to ask you this because I've gotten different answers to this question or or this this frame. So I had one guy come on. 
talking about this about uh, or I don't know if he came on. I think we were offline when we were chatting, and he said, "Hey." With my guaranteed sale, I, 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 I never had to really buy a house because what I do is, is, you know, I will pitch that I will, you know, it's a guaranteed sale. But when I go there, I explain to them, right? So that gets me in the door. When I get there, I explain to them, hey, um, uh, for me to take this risk, number one, I don't need 6%, but I need 10%. And number two, you know, I'm going to price your house, you know, 30 grand. I don't know if he told me, but he said, I'm going to price your house, you know, under the comparables. So, and, and then he said, so, you know, I can see this are kind of shaky, you know, because I'm going to tell them sell it less than what it's really worth. And I want more money than, than everybody else, you know, and then I follow up with, Hey, but listen, I'm confident. I can, you have a great house. I'm confident I can sell it. If you want to just do it regular, uh, we can do that as well. And, and he said, that's kind of where people go. Um, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're not exactly like that, but, um, uh, we, we, we have a guaranteed sale. So we, uh, people ask about the guaranteed sale. And, uh, since we are taking the risk, I do charge a higher commission and the way it tends to work for me. And when I first started doing this, the one thing that occurred to me was that a lot of times the biggest impediment to the sale of a house no matter how nice they are, no matter how smart they are, is the, is the seller, is the owner. You know, they don't sell houses for a living, and everybody has preconceived notions. I tell you, one of the one of the things about pricing that everybody seems to think, and it is dead wrong, is everybody will say, you know what, I can understand that my house is worth three hundred thousand, but we need to price it at three thirty so that we can have room to ne- negotiate. That is the worst pricing strategy in the world. Uh, I mean, you know, it it starts the way I look at it. It starts at a point of disappointment to the client, uh, to the buyer. You know, uh, and what I mean by that is uh, sometimes I give an analogy. I say, you know, um, um, if 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 you were flipping through the paper one day and you saw this ad says brand new Lexus leather seats everything totally loaded ten thousand dollars what would you be saying you'd be saying to your wife honey get in the car we're going to buy another car you know and she'd be she'd be saying well we don't need another car well i don't care we're still buying it and what you would find when you got down there is you'd have a line of a hundred people or more and then the next thing you would see is somebody saying to the salesman hey get rid of the rest of these people i'll I'll, I'll give you fifteen thousand and then it would be twenty thousand and the next thing you know the forty eight thousand dollar car is selling for fifty three thousand um, I have used that strategy on short sales. I listed a short sale uh, a few years ago. The people were really, they, they had to move quick. I put the house on the market at 249. It was a house that was worth probably 280, 290, and we closed it at 310 uh, because it built up that excitement. If we had taken that same property and listed it at 310, I probably would have closed it at 260 or something like that, or 250, you know, so, um, it's, uh, you know, so, um, so, you know, so that's what I do. So with me, with the guaranteed sale, the way, it, the way it started working for me in the beginning was that, uh, I got to decide what was going to be done with the house. Matter of fact, I can remember the first people I did the guaranteed sale with, uh, I went into their house. I looked at it. Matter of fact, they were buying one of the new one, one of the houses we were building. I worked with a lot of builders and all. We were building some houses in this upper end neighborhood, and um, they wanted to buy it, but they had a house to sell. And I, I went in and looked at it. And they said, "Well, we want your guaranteed sale. We hear you got a guaranteed sale for it." I said, "Yep." I said, "I do." And I said, "What you're going to need to do is paint the house and put a new carpet, and we can price it at this." They said, "Well, we're fine with your price, Lance, but..." How about if we just touch up the paint and clean the carpet? I said you can do anything you want to do, but if you want the guaranteed sale, you got to paint the house and put in new carpet. So they painted the house and put in new carpet. In ten days' time, we had competing offers, uh, wow. and that's that's the way it works for me. Is that I get to say what will be done? Got it. And they and to and to get the guaranteed sale, they have to follow it. Um, and um, and, and, and I tell you, in all the years that I've done the guaranteed sale, I've only bought one house that I didn't want to buy. And, um, 
Now, we buy houses that sometimes people call us out to houses, and I go out, and and usually it's houses that are in really bad shape, and I'll just give them an offer and buy it. You know, buy it, just buy it, Boom. and then I renovate it and, and flip it, you know. You have a neat business, Lance. I love it. Um, I want to talk about, I want to talk about uh, in a minute, the, the, um, how this guaranteed sale has, has helped your business grow. Um, oh man, I had such a great question about three minutes ago and I just, I totally lost it. Uh, dang. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, oh, it's pricing strategy. So listen, so, so I'm a real estate investor. I've, I've, I've bought and flipped lots and lots of houses. I've tried everything. <clears throat> I've tried overpricing it. I've tried underpricing it. And I've tried pricing it, um, uh, it with a range, right? And the lower range is, is, uh, let's say 30 grand underpriced, you know, up to whatever, right? So I want to get it, you know, as many people in front of as many people as possible. Here's what has happened to me. And maybe just cause I'm an investor, I have had agents flip out on me, right? Cause I, I put it out there. I'm like, Oh, it's 293, right? 293, 600. Um, and I'll get an offer for 293, 600, right? But I, but I, but that again, that's underpriced and I won't, I won't, I'll say, Hey, I'm not going to take it. And I, I, again, I've had people yell at me. I, I've had people <laughs> yell at me. I've had people, I had this one girl got so mad at me that, um, that, uh, she, she found my contractor's license and then reported me for some stupid thing to the contractor license board. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, my question people is, people can get emotional. <laughs> yeah. I mean, has that ever happened to you that people get angry with you? I, you know, very little, but I, you know, I have, uh, you know, sometimes when we set these houses up, um, you know, we do a good enough job that we get competing offers. And I, uh, one of my agents on my team had a competing offer, uh, just a week or so ago. And I, um, told, um, I told her at the time, I said, believe me, when you have competing offers, uh, somebody is going to be upset because right. <laughs> you know, somebody yeah. isn't going to lose and, and, you know, now if they're more experienced and they're reasonable, they'll understand, you know, okay, I'm upset. We, you know, we wanted it, but we understand, you know, there was competing offers and we lost. Uh, but some of them just are unreasonable. You know, they just, oh, you yeah. know, they just cannot understand. Why did you not take my offer? Uh, I even had one um, a year or two ago that called us back and could not understand. It was the, the buyer they called. And they buyer was being represented by another agent from another company, but called us directly and just could not understand how we did not take his offer, even though he was the lower offer, why we would not at least negotiate with him. And I, I just did not know how to answer his question. I said, sir, the, the other offer was just better. So we always start, if, if everything else is equal, I mean, both of you are qualified to buy, we're obviously going to negotiate with the better author to begin with, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> you know, when people's emotions get going, it can, it can get going. Hey, let me ask you something else. Um, and this is, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the rules are uh, around some of this stuff, but so, you know, when you get competing offers, you obviously want to try to get as much juice as you can, right? So you can, you can, uh, uh, you know, keep going back and forth. And then when you think you have them tapped out, go s send it out back again and go, look, guys, give me your highest and best, <clears throat> right? That's, that's one thing you can do. One thing that, that I have done before, and I, I, for me, it really hasn't been that successful. And I, I want to get your take on it is, is instead of going back and forth and all that, just go to them and say, Hey, listen, this is what I want. This is the number I'll take. Now, I don't know if, you know, it's a little bit maybe different because I'm, 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 I'm both selling it as well as I own it, but have you ever just told people like, is that a negotiating uh, tactic to just say, Hey, listen, I need you to be at three 30. Um, yeah. Um, I've done, uh, uh, not as much, um, more times than not, I'll go back and say, look, I just want to be fair to everybody. I want to let you and, you know, agent a and agent B and agent C know that we have competing offers. And if anybody wants to amend their offer, and just make it the best they can before I present it. You know, now's the time to do it. Got it. Uh, and and a lot of times, what you'll find is the never. We have one that we're closing uh, Friday that uh, uh, went under contract for above list price, 
just because of a situation like that. And um, But there has been a couple of times where I've gone back and said, this is the number we need to hit. If anybody's willing to get there, they can get the contract. Got it. And uh, and it's worked, but it's 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 a harder game to play because one thing, if you have competing offers and you say that to everybody, if all of them say okay, I'll match it, then it really puts you in a place where it's almost like you're um, you know you're playing favorites. Well, if you yeah. chose that agent, why why did you go with them instead of us? We all got the same offer, you know. Right. So right. you kind of got to be careful, you know, because the thing about it is, and I, I run my business, and I try to keep a very good, friendly rapport with as many agents as I can. But you know, when you're in business, sometimes people are going to get upset, and sometimes people are unreasonable, and sometimes you just have to draw the line. It's the nature of doing business. You have to say no. You know, now you're being unreasonable, and we're not going to go any further. We're not going to talk to you. We're not interested in doing business with you. Uh, but you know, what I do try to keep in mind is that, uh, an agent out there say, you know, an, uh, an agent that's been in business for several years or whatever can bring me many buyers and close right. many deals with me. Uh, that one buyer out there probably is only going to do one deal with me, uh, or maybe one deal now. And if they're my clients, maybe a deal in the future, but you know, uh, agents, this is, you know, so I, I try to keep, uh, you know, I, I don't let it hinder me, but I try to keep a good, good, friendly rapport and a working type um, attitude or, or, you know, have that, that type of nature about me and about my team where, you know, we're ready to work with you. We want to, you know, I want agents to feel like when they are showing our properties, uh, I've heard it uh, termed as the law of cooperation. Uh, but when they're showing our properties, they can feel comfortable that these houses uh, look correct, they're priced correctly, and, and, and it's being handled by a team that knows what they're doing. So it makes it easy for the buyer's agents to show our listing. Right, right. That makes total sense. Um, um, the, uh, here's a question that, that I think that um, it's, the audience is going to find valuable, and it's this. When you go, you know, you never, you, you go and preview every property. Now, I'm not saying you, but somebody on your team previews every property and, and you, you help them get it presented for sale, right? Some, and what you said, you said sometimes that's just a decluttering, you know, other times it's, it's putting in new floors or countertops. <laughs> In terms of the best way to do that, right? So let's say that let's say that it's that it's new floors, right? New carpet, and that carpet is five thousand um, dollars. And you know, and this could be for paint. This could be for anything. I think I know your answer, but tell me what for to to enhance that sale, right? To make it faster. Is, am I better off encouraging my client to, number A, I can say, hey, go down to Home Depot, pick some carpet, let's get it installed, or B, listen, guys, let's leave the same carpet in here, but let's give them a $5,000 credit towards, towards the carpet. Which, you know, what do you like better? Um, I don't have to think about that one it's the carpet. hard at all. I like to put it in. What yeah. I have found is that nine out of ten people are visual and they see what they see. And I mean, I've seen it on the extreme. I've got I've got some clients right now, great people. They have become friends of mine. I I tell I help them sell their house, and I'm helping them build their new house right now. And they're great people and all. But especially the husband, I mean, if he cannot see it, he just cannot put it in his imagination. And he's a smart guy, too. It's not that he's, you know, lacking in intelligence. He's a smart guy, a uh, uh, great guy. And, uh, and I find that most people are that way. I mean, they, they see what they see. I tell you, it really came home to me years ago. I was showing a property, and it was a wreck. It was messy. I mean, sometimes it almost embarrasses me how people are willing to show their house. And uh, the house was just a mess. And the very next house we went, and this house was priced at, it wasn't a high price, it was like maybe 150 or something. And uh, the very next house we went into was in very good shape. It was staged properly, it looked great, and my clients were oohing and on. It's like, uh, you know, oh yeah, we like that. And it was priced probably $30,000 above the, the last house. 
It was like 180. And they were like, uh, uh, they, they didn't end up buying either one of these, but they were actually considering that one. And I stood there for a couple of seconds, and it hit me. It was like, this was the same house. We were in the same neighborhood. It was one of those track neighborhoods. I said, and I said to them, I said, guys, do you realize something about this house? And they said, what? I said, this is the exact same house that we just left. It's the exact same floor plan. The only thing that was different was the front exterior was a little different. You know how they'll put a little stone on yeah. this one yeah. and not on that one and stuff like that. And it was the exact same house. I told them, you know, I said, I bet everybody's been passing that house over. If we went back and made a low ball offer, I said, who knows what price you could get that at. And I could, you know, we've even got loan programs and all. We could get this thing renovated for you, and you could have a wonderful house. And they could not see it. They, they were just like, they were just like, Lance, we're, we're just not interested in that house. And that was one of the first times that it really started resonating with me. It's what they see. You know, if you go, you know, that's why, back to my boxes of cereal, that's why when you go in the store, my understanding is I read this someplace once, and I don't know if it's completely true or not, but I, I bet it is, that most cereal that you buy, the box is more in, more expensive than the, the cereal in it. <laughs> so... You know, if we were all completely logical, there would be no boxes. There would be simple brown paper bags with the cereal in it and a little note on it saying it's this kind of granola or whatever. Yeah. And it would be sold a dollar or dollar fifty or two dollars less because they didn't have to pay for that expensive box. But it sold for two dollars more with that expensive box because that people are visual. Uh, with the brown paper bag, they're going to see a brown paper bag. With that box, they see this great display and everything, and the houses are the same way. So, uh, hands down, the best way to do it is, you know, is to do it. Because if you give the allowance, if you finally get that buyer, they're still going to make that offer based on what they're seeing, and then they're going to still take your $5,000. You put the $5,000 in it. And you'll sell it for ten thousand dollars more. Got it. Boom. I'll tell you, man, that was great, great advice. I'm sold. I, I now I know. I've asked that question a few times, and I've been, you know, you know, I'm a fix and flip guy, just like you are. So. I, I see what can be and I don't see what is. I'm sure you can walk into a house and you see, you know, like opportunity rather than, you know, bust it up old Formica, you know. So, hey, Lance. Yeah, you know, so, uh, the, the thing, the reason you can flip houses and the reason I can flip houses is that we're on that lower percentage. We are people that can walk into an old, ugly, beat up house and see what it can be. Yeah. Most people just cannot do that. Amazing. Amazing. I, well, again, for everybody that's listening, uh, th th that piece alone was, I mean, that was just gold. So I appreciate you coming on. Hey, Lance, really, I thank you so much. I mean, I, I learned a lot from this. I'm sure, you know, I got a tweet this morning. Um, I have a big Twitter following and I got a tweet this morning from uh, a, one of my followers. She sent me a picture and it said show notes and, and literally it was three. She took a picture of three pages of single spaced notes, handwritten notes that she had taken from listening to one of these episodes. So I know for a mm -hmm. fact that your episode is going to be like uh, people are, are scribbling furiously. So I uh, let's wrap it up. I'm going to ask you one last question. And it's and it's this Lance. It's, you know, uh, I'm an aspiring agent. I have twenty five bucks. What book should I go buy today? Wow. Uh, if you want to start a team, maybe I tell you a book that I like a lot is, um, uh, and it's not just specifically the real estate, is uh, the Rockefeller Habits. Uh, it, it, it really talks about running a company. So if you're, if you're wanting to develop a team, that may be one of them. And who wrote that? Um, uh, Vern Harnish. I will look it up. Uh, yeah, and so look, for everybody, if you want to get a free copy of that book, just use our link. Just use audibletrial.com slash superagentslive and grab it. Um, Lance, I had fun, man. You're a great guest. 
Hey, I appreciate it a lot. And is there any way that I can get a copy of this, our interview? And Absolutely. Yeah. Once When we release it, I can do – so So first of all, like I don't charge for any of this stuff. So it, everybody can go listen to the show for free. You can go to our site, superagentslive.com, and listen to it there. You can go to iTunes, subscribe, and listen, as well as Stitcher Radio. I can, I can give you a link. Or, uh, again, once we get this all edited, I can send you an MP3 file, and you can you can use it however you want. Oh, that would be great if you could do that. Absolutely. I'll put it in the notes, and I'll make sure that, uh, that my VA gets that to you. So, <clears throat> all right, bud. Hey, you're one of the few guests I would like to, you know, in the future, I'd like to have you come on again. I would love that. I would love that. Uh, it's been fun. Thanks right. a lot. Thank you. See you, bud. Thanks. Bye-bye. Let's go.